welcome back to Dum Dums and Dragons, where improvisers who've never role played before journey into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. I am the Grand Wizard Bukaki, your host. Frank and Quinny's body is unraveling, so Butthole and Alan have teamed up with the young cat person Mr. Mittens to journey into the jungle. But will our heroes survive their trek into this wilderness? Will Marvin Darktooth lead them to their destination? Will Goblin Jr. maintain control over their pack of rental raptors? Find out next on Dom Doms and Dragons. When the box opens, I just say to her, his name is Billy Fingers. <laughs> and inside the box, I've made a small familiar that's about the size of a fist. <gasps> it's made entirely of human fingers, like oh. top to bottom. It's got little finger arms and finger legs, but it's got sort of a bunch of fingers in the body that all bend so it can run and change shapes. Well, and some of them are from other species. Oh, they're all different right? colors. They're all severed fingers that I've sewed together, but it's alive. At the, at the center, you can't see it, but it's like a gem that's powering the whole thing. And there are two fingers at the very top that have severed eyeballs on them so it can oh see. Oh my goodness. And when you open it, it jumps up and like looks at you <laughs> and then it starts scrabbling and it just climbs up your arm and starts standing on your shoulder like looking for it. So it's all human finger sized things with like, two fi- eyeballs on the socks. side. A thumb comes up. Yeah. And, <laughs> and gives you a, like, a, like a thumbs up. So uh, Billy, Billy Fingers? Yeah, that's his name because he's made of fingers and he's named Billy. I'm a little bit confused. I mean, I know about familiars as animals, but never like this. So yeah, no, I wanted it to be special for you. I know a lot about familiars too. Like wizards have them and they're called familiars. But it's mine? Billy Fingers nods vigorously and gives you a thumbs up. In a way that should be horrifying, but instead is actually sort of suave, it winks one of its eyes. It does that by holding two of its finger legs up in front of it and then squeezing them together. And doing a little like shoulder lean to the side. Oh, that's so cute. Can it talk via sign language? I would assume so. I I just kind of take Billy off my shoulder and just kind of hold him out in front of me in both my hands and just look at him and say, are you sure you want this? (laughs) Billy Fingers gives you the thumbs up does the wink thing again, and then does the little weird creepy finger dance. Looks real happy. It's actually really freaking cute. So Billy, what can you do? All the fingers in his body shift around. So he's got one finger holding him up and a bunch of fingers out like plumage. And then I lean forward and go, that's a tree. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like charades. Yeah, he can do that. I mean, he can run around. He can grab small things and carry them. He can sneak places you can't sneak. He immediately runs up your shoulder, climbs halfway down your back, and just scratches that one part you can't reach. So he's sort of like helpful. He can turn your pages if you don't want to turn your pages on your book. And he like goes down and just starts. He's having some trouble though. So he wets one of his fingers against an eyeball. And then flips pages for you. Like basically he's just super useful in that way. And he's super sneaky. So, you know, you can keep him around. (laughs) Don't tell Quinny. Oh man, no, he's way better than Quinny. So do not tell Quinny. Do we have a psychic link? He doesn't have a mind necessarily. Mind, okay. Not yet. I mean, my theory is, because I taught him the tree thing, he probably will get smarter over time, but you got to teach him. It's like having a pet. They only know the tricks you teach him. Huh. But he understands, like, talking. I've had a couple months. Why don't you just get a severed brain from one of your dead people that you've killed? Smash cut to butthole attempting to build a brain one where he's just putting fingers into a brain and, like, this is not working. It looked like a birthday cake from hell. (laughs) So he just slid the brain off the table into a garbage can and went back to work on Billy Fingers. Well, butthole, this is way too much, but thank you. Billy, nice to meet you. I'm Alan. And just so you know, I do not own you. We are partners. (laughs) Billy Fingers gives you... the, the thumbs up. You are free to leave at any time. <laughs> he skitters down into your bag. Do I have to feed <laughs> Billy? <laughs> no, the crystal does it all. Oh, I thought he was going to say, does he eat fingers? You could theoretically add more, but I, it involves some magic that I don't entirely understand. Basically, you know, I got all the god bodies and those went to Quinny. I sort of took as much of the god souls as I could because I had some shards of soul stone and then I just made them breathe on the soul stone before I squished them. <laughs> And then that's sort of power in Billy. It's a little bit horrifying, but okay. Ah, you're a little horrifying too. Uh, It's true. Fair. (laughs) And with those thoughts, you all find your beds and tuck in for the night. Well, you guys are sleeping. Since I'm a cat, I don't really like to sleep during night. So basically what I do... Oh, no. (laughs) I hunt a mouse. (laughs) He puts your hand in a bowl of warm water. (laughs) No. I hunt a mouse. He puts Billy Fingers in a bowl of warm water. Billy Fingers pees himself. (laughs) No. Oh, God. Welcome to my world. (laughs) All right. So, yes, you hunt a mouse. I knit a yarn plate and some socks 
and I put the plate at Ryan's feet, and I try to put the socks on his feet. Can I do a sleight of hand? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Ryan, can you roll me an opposed check? Perception, please. Sleight of hand for a really nice gesture. <laughs> <laughs> I got 14. Yep. And I got 12. Then you successfully sneak those socks on. <laughs> and then I go to sleep on his lap. Aw. Goblin Jr. is like, how much does he I'll weigh? This. <laughs> no, he's 93 pounds. Oh, that's nothing to me. <laughs> that's a turkey sandwich. <laughs> but I was really bad at math. <laughs> Smash cut to Timmy the Orphan, who has just arrived outside with the turkey. Then he hears, 93 pounds? That's a turkey sandwich to me. And he looks at the turkey that's bigger than him, and he's like, oh, this is not 93 pounds. And then he stumbles back off into the night to try and find a bigger turkey. But you guys don't see that because you're asleep. Uh, so you- <laughs> I speak in my sleep. 93 pounds hits my stomach. I go, ah! Turkey sandwich, 93 pounds. <laughs> I don't understand what a pound is, but instinctually, through wisdom, <laughs> I oh know exactly God. what 93 yeah, pounds is. Yeah, Moonham was real happy to be helping you out with that. Minus um, one. All right, so uh, you wake up in the morning of the expedition. It's a blindingly bright morning. You meet back up with Marvin Bonesworth. and Just because I always forget, I literally put a note on my character sheet that just said, have you cast mage armor today? <laughs> I have not. So I'm going to do that now. In the world, on our way here, I actually tattooed that on Alan's forearm where mine says, because Alan burned it off. But where it would have said, Alan is your friend. I, I like that. Oh, yeah, you that um, off. I'm gonna, you burned that off. Brian, I'm going to uh, say that costs you one point of stress. Yeah, I'm fine with that. The funny thing is, though, I'm hanging on Ryan right now. Like, I'm still asleep. Yeah, basically, he all I do is. doesn't even realize I'm on him. I, oh, oh I, no, no, no. I know. I took a bed sheet because you were sleeping and it looks sort of cute. And I sort of made like a shawl, oh like sling God. that holds him in place. And then I put Goblin Jr. as a scarf. So he gets carried too. Because now we've gone, scarf. we've gone from like enemies. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and then <laughs> now he's getting jealous, like a two-year-old where he's like, yeah, I, I'm your favorite. And I'm like, okay. Speaking of jealousy, smash cut to uh, a couple months ago. The Forsaken and Bucky are hanging out. <laughs> Forsaken is wiping some blood of the ripped ab gnome god off his armor. Bucky's just finished drawing a picture of a sling that the Forsaken could maybe carry him in. And he's like, I was thinking maybe this. Never for you! The boy can dream. And then he, he tacks it up <laughs> under the cart where he sleeps. Smash Aww. cut to now where you're wearing that exact <laughs> sling on that exact same design. Aww. Can't figure out where I got this idea from. <laughs> Man, I'm smart. So um, my temporary AC is 14. <laughs> yes, great. All right, thank you. So you meet back up with uh, Marvin Bonesworth, and you notice that he seems to have a little spring in his step because one of his feet is now padded in a sock. I pull up my pants, and I, my pants, I'm wearing armor. I, I try to pull up my armor, but it doesn't work like pants. So instead, I take off a boot, and then I'm awkwardly holding my foot up to show him my socks. And I say, they came for me in the night. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. And then I wake up and I whisper to Ryan's ear, it was me. It was probably him. <laughs> He's the only one I know who knits in this continent. And then I, I stop for a second and I pray, it was Moonhammer. <laughs> it's still me. You can't fool me, heathen. <laughs> I ain't no heathen. Garfield be praised. You mount up the cart. We climb on our raptors. Yep. So into this. I'm like, you go, Blue. But most importantly, you listen to your master. And I point at Goblin Jr., who I let down <laughs> yeah, from all, my All the raptors, spot. like, start to go. And then Goblin Jr. just turns around and gives them the worst cut eye. And they all just stop. And, like, you guys are kind of giving them, like, the go, go. And then Goblin Jr. waits. And he waits two extra beats, like when you're giving a dog a treat. And then he nods. And he holds up his little paw and a little fist. And then they bolt forward. Then together you uh, ride out of town into the jungle. And I've got Billy kind of on my shoulder saying, like, so what other dance moves do you know? He can actually do the wave. But it's terrifying because it's it's a full body, 360 degree circle of finger extensions. And he tries to do the worm, but it's hard because he keeps landing on fingers and kind of like, he's working on it. He's a little ashamed, but he wants you to know that he's trying. Right. He can definitely party rock. Everyone can party rock. And he can do the hammer dance on two little fingers, just going back and forth. And his top fingers do the same thing. <laughs> yep. And if you buy additional loot boxes, you might unlock more emotes. Oh, um, today's game also brought to you by EA. You can also get a pink Billy the Fingers skin. <laughs> but only if you pre-order. You start to make your way into the jungle. The heat is oppressively hot. It's like when you were in the uh, the desert trying to find the oasis, mm. but uh, much moister. The uh, expedition seems to be in, in good spirits. The weather's pretty good for traveling. Marvin hands out some little pots of bug repellent. 
that it's just ah. rub in because there's definitely mosquitoes and bugs coming. I'd say they're probably leaving you alone, Mr. Mittens, just because you're furry. So they don't land on you, but Butthole and Alan and Stephanie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Mr. Mittens caller. I'm simultaneously talking to Marvin to try to introduce him to the worship of Moonhammer. Ugh. And because the bugs are all around me, I'm creating like a Moonhammer based bug zapper in that I'm casting blue flame relatively constantly. <laughs> it's got to the point where blue flame just for this track has become pretty casual. So it's just me being like, so let me tell you about Moonhammer. Blue flame. Uh, and then the <laughs> fart encircles my body, hits Moonlight Bringer, sparks, and does like a little loop of flame killing bugs. <laughs> and then I'm like, so she's a pretty great god. Blue flame. Yeah, I just, I just kind of imagine that you're just kind of like leaning back and forth in your saddle. It's like in Harry Potter when they start casting spells but without really saying them anymore. It's Marvin, on the one hand, kind of frustrated with all the farting. Uh, on the other hand, really effective at keeping the bugs away. As soon as I feel like I'm starting to win him over, I start including him in the blue flame so we both get our bugs burned away. This is just the beginning. Well, I mean, I appreciate you uh, telling me all about Moonhammer, but I, I could never turn my back on the Duke. I love the Duke. Who's the Duke? Marmaduke! And his, his brother deity, Odie. Yeah, he's, he's good too. Yeah. <laughs> we hate normal. So we're, we're just talking about because I'm a soft sell now because I also got to read whether or not Marvin seems like a good dude. Yeah, you don't want another Fiddlesworth on your hands? No, I really <laughs> don't. Can you roll me a uh, insight, I guess? 22 total. Jesus. You're using your usual tactics. Despite the fact that Marvin seems to be like a fairly good mercenary commander, it's just something a little off. You're not sure. Just in some of his responses, the way he talks about the Duke, you got a bit of an odd feeling. Yeah, maybe the Duke is the right fit for you. Let me know if you ever want to hear the, the word of Marm. I'm interested. So what I do is as I'm riding along beside him, I keep blue flaming, but I'm just trying to figure this dude out. I'm not even really listening to his words because I'm a terrible investigator. So I don't try to like actively think about it. Instead, I'm letting everything he says just wash over me. And I know at some point I will be able to put it together when I'm like sleeping or farting or something later. Cool. You're farting now. But it'll be a later fart where the idea will land. Ah, an idea fart. It looks like a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, light bulb <laughs> fart. So he's telling you about all the miracles that Marmaduke has performed. Like that time he had four skateboards. That seems like more than a dog should have. And yet... He had it. And various other instances of Marmaduke doing incredibly human things. And yeah, you just kind of let it wash over you. You get the sense he's genuine and that, that his, his belief in his deity is genuine. But yeah, you're slowly collecting a picture of who this dog man is. Meanwhile, Mr. Mittens, what are you doing on the track so far? So Alan's teaching Billy Fingers how to dance. There's four other guards with you who are kind of like moving along with carts. What are you doing? I'm just knitting. Okay, what are you knitting this time? Pillow. Nice. See, that makes sense because he slept on a man who wears plate mail last night. Yeah, so yeah, I'm thinking yeah. a pillow might upgrade his sleeping on butthole experience. Yeah, you gotta soften that. Cool. You travel uh, relatively without incident, but then Marvin gives the sign. He immediately stops talking. You're sort of up on a crest. So you're following a path that seems to be sort of somewhat well trod. It's already been cut. Just ahead of you, you can see some smoke rising above the tree line. I lean over to Marvin and I go, is there a village around here, people? No, no, no villages in any direction. Couldn't it just be someone cooking something? Does it look like cooking amounts of smoke, Tom, or is it smoke, smoke? It's just like a campfire smoke. Should we be worried, Marvin, or should we just go scope this out? I don't know. I'm a little, a little concerned. Seems sort of odd at this time of the day. Oh, do you guys want to go check it out? Yeah, that's fine. I'll go. I'll follow the cat guy on the raptor. Okay, so he kind of yeah, keeps the uh, group back and lets you go on ahead. You come down through another winding kind of jungly trail and you ride into a small encampment. Okay. It looks like it's been sort of hastily cleared. You see three pitched tents. In the center, there's a large campfire. You can also see there's kind of a picnic table like you would stick on the back of a donkey. Perhaps most noticeable, you see the corpses of several explorers. The northmost tent has a guy fallen slumped against it with a spear through his back. There's a guy who's halfway in and out of the fire. There's uh, someone slumped over. It looks like they were eating at the table. And in the eastmost tent, you can see just a foot sticking out of it. You're approaching from the west. Is there anybody alive in the camp? Can you roll me a perception check, please? Okay. 11. You take a quick look around, and they seem to be dead somewhat recently. But uh, yeah, none of them seem to be moving. I'm going to do whatever the equivalent on a raptor of, of like kicking your heels into the horse. I, I want to charge into the camp and jump off sort of like moonlight bringer in hand and shield in other hand. And then I just want to check the bodies because if there's anybody who's still breathing or anything, we can help them and find out what the, the hell happened. You quickly search around, but uh, it looks like all of them have been dead long enough that you won't be able to revive them. Plus with the death curse on everyone, you'd have difficulty doing that anyway. Just look at the other two and I say, hey, we can take their stuff. I'm going to look inside the tents. See okay, if anybody's cool. Alive. So we've got Mr. Mittens looking inside the tents. Uh, Alan, and I just doing? want to do an arcana check to see if I can see if this was a magical <laughs> cause or if... 
it was something physical. Sure. And Ryan, you're kind of on the guard. Yeah, I'm going to have Goblin Jr. send the Raptors out to do like a circle perimeter defense. Sure. And then I'm just going to scope outside the tents to see if there's any like chests or any travel gear or anything. Like I don't know what they'd have. Sure. Mr. Mittens, in the tents you search, seems to be um, sort of an explorer party. It looks like they were trying to chart this particular uh, part of the jungle. Mm-hmm. They don't seem to be particularly well equipped. You get the sense they probably would go on at best sort of three day treks out into the jungle and then mm-hmm. come back. So you find some rations. They've definitely got weapons, but they're more defense weapons than they are attack weapons. They've got things like spears and halberds, like weapons to keep things at distance in case they encounter any dinosaurs. You find some bows and arrows. It looks like, as someone who also appreciates a good nap in the middle of the day, you can see that their bed rolls and things seem to have been set up for bed, but it doesn't look like they ever made it to sleep. Hmm. Alan, in a cursory search of the situation, doesn't look to be magical. Yeah. It seems like... Most of them have been hit by axes or spears. Mm. However, you do note that one of them appears to have died of a poisoning. Oh, geez. Can I tell what kind of poison? From first look, it's on their neck, and Mm. you can see that there's an incision. It looks almost like a scorpion sting to you. Oh, geez. I'm going to have cast guidance on myself and prayed before I start my walk to look around and find stuff, because I want to find whatever Moonhammer thinks is most important for me to find. As you do that, you find a wooden carved mask that seems to be sort of discarded on the edge of the the jungle looks to be a crude representation of a dinosaur's head. Interesting. Can I fit that mask on with my helmet? It's like flat wooden mask. So you could tie it around the back of your head and wear it in front of you. It will limit your visibility quite a bit, but sure. I'm going to try putting it on to see if anything happens. You feel pretty cool. And you have a hard time seeing, but other than that, nothing happens. Cool. So what I do is I'm going to take the mask and then flip it around so the mask is at the back of my head. Yep. And I look over to Alan and I go, now they won't know which way I'm looking. (laughs) I stare blankly um, because there's no response. Goblin Jr. is like, snarf, snarf. Yeah, she does get it. I just look at Billy. He rolls his eyes. (laughs) We have so many companions now. He gets me. (laughs) As you're exploring and like you're you're messing with the mask, you hear, what did you do? Then you hear a raptor cry and a similarly high-pitched voice go like, what the do? And then like some ripping and tearing and screaming. And all of a sudden, bursting out of the jungle are incredibly strange sights to all of you. Basically, you see a line of masks and a line of arms come bursting out of the jungle. They seem to have axes and clubs and spears. Alan, can you roll me a perception check? 17. If you're not entirely mistaken, that is five goblins stacked on top of each other wearing masks. And so four of these stacks burst through the trees, uh, and there's a couple, like, little guys running after them. Roll initiative, everybody. Oh, yeah. Combat time. 19. 19. 18 for me. Five. Alan is very startled. Mr. Mittens, you've seen these guys before. You know what their deal is. These are Batiri battle stacks. You know that the goblins of the area often try and stack up to seem larger than they actually are. But there's one real good way to make these stacks smaller. I know. And it's to murder them. So you're... (laughs) You are first up in the initiative order. You are by a tent in the eastmost part of the camp. One of the stacks is coming out. One's coming from the northeast. One's coming from the northwest. It's basically each corner of the encampment. Okay. If we want to say this audibly from the map Tom just gave us, fire at the center, and then in all four corners, northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest, there's a tent. And there's one stack coming from the direction of each tent, essentially? Yeah, they're coming in from the four corners. I'm going to go to the one that's closest to me, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to overhead slash him. Swing that flail. Like that. Let's do it up. 26. (laughs) (laughs) I look over to Alan, and I go, Mr. Menz is no Prince Mudbutt. That's for sure. Princes can be useful. He's a lot less greasy. (laughs) And naked. (laughs) And he hasn't set anything on fire. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you obviously hit... I do 14 damage. So I'm going to give each of these stacks a name just so that we don't go completely insane. The name will be of the mask that's on the top of the stack. Ah. You are attacking Elephant. So you rush in, you swing your flail over the head, swing it around. And I think, Butthole, this is an instructive moment for you because you're like, oh, man, I don't think that yarn's going to do much damage. And Mr. Mittens, as you swing down with your mighty flail, the first goblin just explodes. And as the flail passes through his erupting body, the goblin beneath him looks up and it just smashes through the mask and into his face. So two goblins fall off the stack. <clears throat> the bottom three have to roll a save to see if they stay standing. They do. So that is Elephant. So we've got Elephant. So and what are the other three? In South East, by the picnic table, we have Eagle. Southwest, we have Tiger. And in Northwest, we have Rhino. 
With Rhino, there are two little dudes wearing goggles. They're goblins, and they seem to be carrying backpacks. And where am, where am I? I'm going to say you and Butthole are by the fire. So oh, dead okay, center, we're you can pick middle. where you want to go. Yep. Cool. Butthole, you see Mr. Mittens engage in the Northeast and start whacking goblins to death. I gesture to Goblin Jr. and point to Eagle. Yes. And I gesture for him to go after Eagle with our raptors. So Goblin Jr. points to Blue and snarfs, snarfs. And Blue does that thing that raptors do in Jurassic Park when they're taking charge, where it's like, <laughs> and then all the raptors go after Eagle. And you hear Eagle Stack go, oh, da, da. Mr. Mitten speaks goblin, can kind of translate roughly to clever girl. I, I speak orc, so what does that translate to in orc? Somewhat smart lady. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing is, though, I was on my raptor. Well, do you know you're going to have a fun ride? Yay! So, Mr. Mittens, you find yourself pulled towards Eagle. Now, <laughs> here's here's the question. Um, <laughs> given that you were engaged in combat, do you want to leap off and continue to fight Elephant, or do you want to ride the raptor towards Eagle? I'm going to ride it towards Eagle. As you do so, the three goblins in the elephant stack take attacks of opportunity. Your AC, good sir. Is 17. Dun, so, dun, dun, dun. two of them will hit you, take nine points of damage. But, hold on, I'm going to say that's your action, since you're directing a ton of stuff at them. Where would you like to move? I'm going to look over at Tiger, and then I turn to Alan. You know what trumps Tiger? Dinosaur. And I take the mask from the back of my head and pull it around to the front, and then I just want to, like, shoulder charge the stack here. I'm going to say you start to sprint at them, and then we'll resolve that as the top of your next round. It won't be an action. It'll be a consequence of your movement. Yep. Cool. Which brings us to the guys in the goggles. One of them is going to rush towards Alan. The other one's going to try and intercept Bobbert. The one that runs at Alan, you see him like kind of scrabbling around inside his bag and he's muttering to himself and then he pulls out a jar Mm -hmm. and he looks at you and he unscrews the jar quickly and then he throws the contents at you. I cast shield as a reaction. And you are covered in centipedes. Ah, Um, So a swarm of insects uh, materializes around you. You are going to take... What kind of damage are they doing to me? Pincing and biting and swarming and eating. Remember the uglier centipedes who have those giant, like, claw heads? They're those. Ten points. Billy Fingers, as my familiar, is obviously immediately coming to my rescue. He's basically rolling around all over me, and as he approaches a centipede, flicking them off with, like, all of his little fingers. Nice, nice. Good work, Billy Fingers. The other inventor is going to run at Butthole, and he is going to dig into his bag of tricks, and he comes up with... I'm hoping it's honey. A small vial. He shakes it, and he throws it at you, and it bursts into flames. You're going to take four points of damage, and you are on fire as the alchemical flames uh, coat your armor. Your cool dinosaur mask is now like a charred dinosaur mask, but it's kind of metal because you're like running on fire with a flaming dinosaur mask. So, you know, ups and downs. And then the two inventors give themselves an air five. That brings us to Goblin Jr. and the Raptors. Give them Raptors. What could go wrong? This could go wrong, McGee. Yeah, you gave us combat horses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so um, Goblin Jr. is like, snarf, snarf, and they go, ooh, ooh, and they uh, leap at the Goblin stack. Goblin Jr. was where the stack was looking. Yeah, but the raptors came from the, from the sides. sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess we could change the name of this goblin stack to Robert Muldoon stack. <laughs> so Muldoon stack gets attacked from both sides. The two unencumbered raptors leap forward. Both of them manage to hit. Collectively, they shred one of the goblins because they were running. Raptor Senior is going to take a leaping jump. And succeed. So as you're kind of like rodeo riding through, the two raptors come from the sides, shred a goblin in half, and then you leap through the gap made by that goblin. So if the goblins are stacked from the bottom up, one to five, goblin four gets ripped in half. And as goblin five is free falling, your raptor leaps through the gap, grabs him and pins him to the ground and starts tearing at him. So the goblin is still alive, but your raptor is biting on him. Ah! It's the sound Mr. Mittens makes, just while watching. Yes. Alan, what's your raptor name? His name is Ted. Just Ted. So Blue and Ted are both chewing on the half goblins that they ripped apart. Which brings us to the goblin stacks. So the goblin who is pinned under Mr. Mittens and Raptor Senior is having none of that. Screaming as his face is being bitten off, he's going to attempt to stab up into Raptor Senior's throat. He will hit, and with a mighty cry, Raptor Senior slumps to one side. He's not dead, but he's badly injured. The remaining three goblins on the stack are going to take swings. One on Blue, one on Ted, and one on Mr. Mittens. Blue is hit. Ted is not. 
Mr. Mittens is not. Ted takes four points of damage. Rhino Stack is going to rush Alan. Mm -hmm. Um, So they kind of run toddling at you, and the ones who can are going to take swings. Okay, so only one of them will manage to hit you because of your your magical shielding. Uh, They seem very vexed as their spears and axes veer off in Mm -hmm. weird directions. They know where they should be hitting you. So they'll hit you for five points of damage. Meanwhile, Tiger is going to... They see you charging at them. So they're basically going to just shift from a full top stack to like a squatter battle stack. So four of them (laughs) fall down and one stands on top with two swords out. (laughs) And they are prepared for your charge. And that brings us to Elephant. Elephant is surprised to see Mr. Mittens running away. They are going to pursue you. They chase you down and one of them is going to throw his spear at you because they can't reach you. He will hit and you will take uh, six points of damage, please. Which brings us to Alan. I'm going to acid splash the two goblins on the bottom of the stack. So they need to make a dex save. Okay, I'm going to give them disadvantage because basically it's the guy on the bottom is going to have to make it. He's the one holding everyone up. But he's going to be at disadvantage because he's holding holding everyone everyone up. (laughs) You know he failed at. (laughs) All right. God, it's only six acid damage, but for both of them. The goblins, they're mighty proud of their successful attacks against you, and then all of a sudden, the guy on the bottom starts going like, which you understand to mean, help, help, or an orcish, please assist me, sir. (laughs) Um, And you see the guy on the bottom covered in acid, can't really keep a hold of the stack anymore. You can see his little arms trembling, and Mm -hmm. then the guy above him's legs come through his acid-stained body. Now, the stack is still standing, but he's standing in his friend right now. And he's also covered in acid. You get the sense that he is one HP away from death. Um, (laughs) Top of the round, the way the situation is currently working, Mr. Mittens is engaged on Raptor Senior, as well as the Raptor Pack and Goblin Junior, with Muldoon Group in the southeast. Muldoon Group currently is three goblins on the stack, one goblin prone on the ground being eaten by a raptor. To the northeast, or I guess just the east now, we have Elephant Stack charging towards that combat. Elephant Stack currently three people because Mr. Mittens killed two of them. (laughs) Tiger Stack has dropped into a defensive formation in preparation for your shoulder charge. There were five of them. Rhino Stack is four goblins high, and the bottom goblin is wearing a goblin as a suit. A weird <laughs> goblin suit. Oh, I... So, top of the round, Mr. Mittens, sitting atop your mighty steed, Raptor Senior. Um, there's a goblin. The raptor's attacking at your feet. Behind you, there's a stack of three tall. You can attack either one. What would you like to do? I'm going to attack this three tall one. I got a 26 again. 26, yeah, that'll do. Roll your damage. I did 11 damage. So you kill the top guy, smash the flail into the back of his head, and the goblins below suddenly feel a little bit lighter as their friend falls smushed off to the side of them. So that brings Elephant Stack down to two. Butthole, you are shoulder charging in. Can you roll me an athletics check? 20 total, but not natural. Despite their defensive formation, you are just very large, and you're on fire. So you barrel into them, and you scatter them like bowling pins, (sighs) which leaves one of them prone directly at your feet. I look to that guy who set me on fire, and I just say, Moonhammer, he's yours! And I reach out, and then the wonderful thing about this spell, oh, I've missed it. The wind coalesces. This one's bigger than it's ever been before. It circles the whole place, and I fart, and it starts it. It's like when all the kids in the pool at the Y go in a circle, and then the pool just starts going on its own. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it coalesces into a spectral hammer. Only this spectral hammer is actually the arm of Moonhammer with the hammer for a hand. It's just taking a fucking swing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's a 12-year-old cat person. Uh, it's taking a, a gosh darn swing at this friggin' goblin that set me on fire. I'm not allowed to swear, but you can. That's very generous of you. I'm going to try to be a better person than usual, though. Go ahead and uh, roll your attack. My parents do it all the time. Total on the, the attack is a 12. <laughs> that will hit barely. The way I'd like to imagine this hands of Moonhammer, rather than like the normal like floating spectral hammer, I feel like it just comes out of space and time, smacks, and then disappears back into space and time, comes out of space and time, smacks. Nice. Ooh, I like that. Yep. Like whack a mole cool. style. Yeah, like Nightcrawler. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two. <laughs> Nightcrawler whack a mole. It does. Eight damage. The inventor is like starting to rifle around in his bag. You see him pull out a, a sack just as the hammer hits him. And he's lucky enough to drop the sack back into his bag just in time to not have any adverse effects from it. But he takes a hammer squarely to the face and can see he's pretty bloody. At the same time, I yell at the top of my lungs in Orcish, surrender to the queen of hell. Uh, What it sounds like to them is sit down to the friend of dark. And then I cast a spell called Hammer Guardians, in which point I look up 
and I just fart, and every fart takes out a little hammer, three inches. Yeah, like a little spectral. like a, like a doctor would hit your knee with it. Like exactly, a reflex hammer? exactly. Yeah. It's like a miniature war hammer like that. Only I keep farting, and it's like a machine gun fart, like oh just and every time a hammer comes out, and they just form this swirling mass of spectral hammers that surround me, fifteen feet in all direction. One could say. It's very similar to the atheistic pain zone that I yes, had created. Yeah, it seems so. Well, the good news is you've got five goblins at your feet, and all of them are in that zone. Yes, so at the start of their turn, they have to pass a wisdom saving throw. If they pass, they only take half of 3d8 radiant damage. If they fail, they take 3d8. So we have well, to wait for their turn. there's one things we know goblins are very much of, it is wise. <laughs> <laughs> the goddess is with you. That brings us to the inventors. One of them is looking around for the hammer that just hit him in abject shock. Oh, um, and Ryan, you can roll a check to see if you put yourself out. Honestly, I rolled a seven. There's no you way. You are still on fire. Good. I look cool. <laughs> uh, which means you will take four points of fire damage. Dang. So he looks at you, and he seems to want to continue his quest to destroy you. So he reaches into his bag, and he digs around, and let's see what he finds. Well, you know, he saw how successful the centipede swarm was for his buddy. So he pulls out a jar of centipedes and he throws it at you. Uh, it shatters against your armor. Nat 20, so they definitely hit. See, the problem is wearing the mask, it traps them inside the helmet once they get there. You're going to take seven points of damage. I rolled three ones. I will take what I can get. <laughs> However, I'm going to roll to see if they can keep their form given that you are on fire. They do not. So the centipede swarm hits you and they're like biting you, but... They're on fire. You're on fire. It's all horrible, but uh, they burn up against your armor. One falls. I open my mouth and eat it. Surprisingly delicious. Not bad. Somewhere you think Ramsey would be pretty proud of you. Do you know where he is? Inside me. Because I <laughs> snorted, snorted him. him. <laughs> yep. That brings us to the other inventor going after Alan. So he digs around in his bag and let's see what he finds. He pulls out a stick. Yeah. A stick? And he just rushes at you with a stick. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to shield his reaction. Yep. Of course. Uh, oh, as he gets closer, though, you can see that tied to the end of that stick, he's a scorpion. Alan, you, what's your AC right now? 19. He will miss, but barely. Oh, and it's you just so hear a little amazing. clickety clackety, clickety clackety near your ear. Which brings us to Goblin Jr. and the Raptors. Let's see if Goblin Jr. recharges. He does. So we'll get the Raptors in there. Attacking the guy on the ground. Go Raptor Senior. Raptor Senior just does that raptory thing where like pulls back, cocks his head, and then just grabs the throat and plucks it out like a little. I pet him. Yeah. Good Raptor Senior. <laughs> the two attacking the Muldoon group. One will hit. Pulls one of the stack off, which means the stack is now down to one. So now it's just a single goblin standing there. Pulls him down and just goes to town, ripping him up. You notice, though, that Ted seems to be breathing pretty hard and the, the wound seems to be getting worse, which brings us to the battle stacks. So wisdom save, huh? Wisdom save it is. It is not. <laughs> the goblins, they're on the ground there. They're looking up and all of a sudden there's just hammers for days. They failed, so they all take eight damage. Amidst the rapid fire machine gun noise of the farts, you hear like it's like someone crinkling plastic or something as all of their tiny goblin-y bones get shattered by tiny hammers and the entire battle stack is dead because they only have seven HP. Nice. So that is the end of Tiger Stack. All right. Tiger. The only stack that attempted to defend themselves <laughs> and the ones who died the fastest, which brings us to Rhino Stack attacking Alan. Oh, I get two attacks. Well, we'll start using those in future. Yes. Do you know what? Mr. Mittens has been secretly holding back his attacks <laughs> to impress us <laughs> at a dramatically a, convenient moment. It's a moment. princess bride tactic where he's going to be like, I'm also not left-handed. Okay, so uh, Alan, what's your AC right now? I'm still 19. So two will hit. Meh. Alan, you're going to take 14 points of damage Ugh. as they, they stab Meh. and poke and, and I'm getting and angry. So, Alan, you have an insect swarm on you. I'm going to see if it dissipates. It has a 50% chance to dissipate. It does not, and they're going to try and bite you. They will fail because of your shield. <laughs> By your shield, I, of course, mean our boy fingers just punching them off. <laughs> awesome. just Billy's just yes. like, yeah, it's just My in, Billy shield. Yeah, it's just in full pugilist mode. You can attack the swarm if you so desire. I can? Uh, yeah, which brings us to you. Cool. I'm going to cast Magic Missile. At level three, that gives me five missiles. So I'm going to fire one magic missile at the guy on the bottom. Okay. And then two each on the two above. Okay. So bottom one gets five. He explodes. The goblins above him fall into a double thick goblin goo. <laughs> oh my God. And then five damage on the one above him. Okay. And then seven damage on the one above him. So here's how this goes. The guy at the bottom explodes. Guy above him gets hit and coughs out blood. Guy above him explodes, and then the dude from the top of the stack falls through, hits the guy beneath him for... <laughs> 
<laughs> four yeah. points, kills a guy beneath him, <laughs> and just lands in a puddle of misery. It's one of those moments where it's like, when you reach into a puddle of goo that used to be your best friend's face, he like takes off his mask and he just looks up at you in like <laughs> abject horror. And um, I take that moment to then, as my bonus action, Misty step the hell away from that swarm. So I'm going to Misty step over a butthole. And is. you can be safe within my field. So she could just appear beside me and spectral hammers are spinning, defending us both now. Oh, cool. That's his version of Leo Open's tiny I hut. I like this. <laughs> yeah, it's a murder hut. <laughs> Top of the round, Mr. Mittens. Yeah. So currently there's only one goblin left in Muldoon stack. I shall let you live for now. So I'm going to go over to the elephant stack. Okay. Remember me? And I do my overhead swing again because I love doing that swing. Okay, do it up. 12. That will not hit the first one. Uh, then roll your second attack. I got a 26 again. You absolutely hit, so roll your damage. I got a 16. You definitely <laughs> kill that top goblin. So you smack him down. Butthole, the two inventors are near you. The one that's closer to me is the one who Moonhammer slapped around last turn. So what I want to do is I'm going to run to the other one. Yep. Is who I want to head at. Scorpion stick. Yeah. But the fun thing about this field is that it hurts people when people enter it. So I would like to run close enough that I don't deal with an attack of opportunity because it's within 15 feet. But I can tag the other guy on the way. He's not going to stand there and watch the field come at him. He would get out of the way. That so you'll sense. miss okay. the injured one, but the fresh one, you're, you're right there. Cool. Yeah. So I'll go at the fresh one with that then. While I'm doing that, he sees the field go by and he's like, ah, I nailed it. And then Moonhammer's arm is just going to come from behind him to try to hit him in the back. 12. Yep. That'll hit the inventor. And it does 11 damage. He's like digging around in his pack. You see him pull out a huge health potion, like the biggest health potion you've ever seen. And he uncorks it. And then all of a sudden, the spectral hammer just swings through, smashes it into his face, which explodes in his face, heals his face, and then they force the hammer, kills his face. Uh, he's, <laughs> he had quite a journey. Nice. <laughs> um, he really should have started with that healing potion. So the other inventor looks at you and holds up his scorpion stick, real nervous as you so rush in. So he's facing a rain of hammers, both spectral and, in this case, literal. <laughs> so I come in. In the words of Joaquin Phoenix in Signs, Swing away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do, which, which one do you want to resolve first, Tom? Let's do your hammer swing. And then if there's anything left, we'll spectral hammer. I, I was actually looking over my shoulder watching the other guy get hit. So I turned back to this hit and I Ooh, a scorpion. score 10. Oh, no. No, no, no. So my swing misses because he ducks, and then I concentrate, and all of the spectral hammers swing a little lower, so the zone is, like, at ground right, height now yeah, to, like to take a shot at him. All right. Wisdom save? Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> and he will take 13 damage from the spectral hammers. The hammers start pounding him into the ground, and he starts crawling, and he manages to, like, crawl beyond the field and he gets up he's all like beaten and bruised and he, he looks awful and he stands up proudly and he goes to give you the finger and then he looks down and realizes the scorpion from his scorpion stick is lodged in his chest and the poison just starts spreading and he looks down and looks up and sighs like hey that poor goal and you have like mondays or in orcish uh yes the day of after weekend and then, <laughs> and then he drops to his knees and falls over dead so both inventors are now dead you now currently have three goblins Two on a stack, one on the ground, engaged with Mr. Mittens. Can I yell over to Goblin Jr.? I don't know if this will work or not, but I think I'm going to try. And I'm like, take one alive! Okay. So that brings us to Goblin Jr. and the Raptors. Does Goblin Jr. recharge? He does. So Goblin Jr. is like, snarf, 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 and holds up the fist. Ted's eyes are rolling back into his head, and he kind of like falls over. But Blue nods and is going to leap up on the one who's on the ground and pin him. So he just does that like raptor pinning thing where he's like, I'm on top of you. Raptor Senior is going to attack the top goblin in the stack. He misses. It would seem that his injury is pretty bad too, which brings us to the stack. So these goblins are good. They tried their best. How many are left on my stack? Two. I thought I killed one. You did. There's one. There's one left. So there's just two goblins. So we got pinned guy and the lonely goblin who's left. So he runs. I throw my javelin at him. <laughs> roll your attack. Come on, baby. 20, not natural. 20 will hit. Okay. So go ahead and roll your damage. I got it eight. In his head, he's just like, you know, I told them we should have just cut our luck. We killed those explorers. It was great. Today's been... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the puppy poker emerges from his chest and pins him to a tree. The centipede swarm, no longer having anyone to attack, dissipates, and that will be the end of combat. Ba -da 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 -da. You're all feeling pretty good about yourselves. Except for Ted. Ted's okay. He's just oh, like gently Ted. unconscious. Blue's up on top of the goblin. Everything's great. 
Can all of you roll me a perception check, please? Okay. Yes. I got a 17. I'm 19. 19. Each of you notices something different. Mr. Mittens from on top of Raptor Senior, suddenly you notice his head snaps over to the direction that Blues is. And you can see he does that thing Raptors do in real life. Uh, the Raptors do it in a dress <laughs> park where like he kind of like bears his teeth. And it's still kind of adorable because he's wearing the kitten uh, outfit. outfit yeah, but like <laughs> also gently menacing. Alan, you can see the trees are shifting dramatically in the uh, southeast corner. And oh whole you've pulled out your stein and you notice that the water in it is doing oh the like gosh. the puddle move thing. And sure enough, suddenly bursting through the trees is a giant undead Tyrannosaurus Rex, which snaps up Blue and the Goblin and throws them back and forth and then does that classic when dinosaurs ruled the earth roar and you find yourself staring down an undead T-Rex. This episode of Dum Dums and Dragons features the voices of Ryan LaPlante at the Ryan LaPlante on Twitter, Tyler Hewitt at Tyler underscore Hewitt on Twitter, Laura Hamstra at EL Hamstring on Twitter, our special guest, and our DM Tom McGee at McGee TD on Twitter. This episode's sound was edited and mixed by Laura Hamstra and Dum Dums and Dragons artwork is by Del Borovic who can be found at delborovic.com. Our theme songs are and now for that massive coronary and skipping through the orchestra pit part one by peter gresser and our ad music is no control and chiefs by jazzar j-a-h-z-z-a-r all available at freemusicarchive.org when it comes to dum-dums and dice you can visit our website at dumdumdice.com our twitter and instagram are at dumdumdice and on facebook at facebook.com slash dumdumdice but most importantly we've got merchandise at redbubble.com slash people slash dumdumdice or you can join our patreon at patreon.com slash dumdumdice that's d-u-m-b d-u-m-b d-i-c-e and tune in next week for more dum-dums and dragons.